Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Training Tuesday webinar on cures and curing and sealing. My name is Heidi Reese, and I'm with the marketing department at Dayton Superior. Our Training Tuesday team is super excited that you've decided to join us today on our chemical topic. So let's discuss some housekeeping like we do each week. Um, everyone joining the call has been muted so that there are no outside disturbances to take away from others' learning experiences. But I don't want you to stop asking questions or let that stop you from asking questions. We do invite you to ask them through the Zoom chat feature. Um, at the end, there'll be a brief question and answer session and I'll ask for you uh, to the presenter and we'll get them answered. Also, this webinar is being recorded so that you can re-listen or send it to someone who might find it beneficial. So let's get to it. We have a great presenter for you today that knows the ins and outs of chemicals. He'll be discussing cures and curing and sealing, and we'll go over what they are and the differences between them. So within this webinar, he'll discuss their importance and industry standards that should be met for your project. In addition, he's gonna provide you with some key products to help you be successful in the next project. So who is our presenter, you ask? Todd Fraker is our presenter, and he's the Dayton Superior's National Chemical Manager. He's been with Dayton for 38 years, so he's been around that block a time or two when it comes to chemicals. But he's not just a chemical expert. He has worked and sold everything that Dayton Superior has to offer at least once. His sales roles have consisted of being a dealer sales manager, regional sales manager, senior chemical manager, and now our national chemical manager. That is a mouthful. So Todd has a bachelor's of science in chemical engineering and is a great asset to have on your side when you have chemical questions. He has written many of our training modules that Dane Superior uses, and now he will be presenting his knowledge on curing and sealing as well as cures. So Todd, teach us. Thank you, Heidi. Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, depending on the part of the country you're in. Um, Here's our bulletproof and our legalese at the front of the presentation. Today, we're going to discuss curing and cure and sealers and the difference between the two. What is curing? The importance of curing, types of curing, the industry standards for curing and liquid curing compounds. That first specification is ACI 308. That's the American Concrete Institute, followed by ASTM C309 and ASTM C1315, which is our national testing registry here in the United States for everything from seat belts to concrete curing compounds. Uh, we're gonna go over a curing membrane overview, curing seals overview, and we might even throw in a few sealers at the end and the difference between all three of them. All right, the action of curing. Curing is a deliberate action taken to maintain moisture and temperature conditions in the concrete while it is hydrating, namely while the Portland cement is taking up the water that was in the mix in order to become um, an amorphous gel, or you know it as hard concrete. The process of curing is hydration, and it is the reaction between the hydraulic cement and the water. Why? Curing allows the concrete to develop the strength properties that were designed into the mixture by the engineer and the ready mix producer. Loss of any of this water can lead to defects in the concrete, and can lead to reduced strength, which is not what the engineer wants. If you're supporting a building with 5,000 PSI concrete, it doesn't do you no good to have concrete coming in at 3,000 PSI. Hydration with Portland cement only occurs when water is available. Hydrated cement binds with the fine aggregate to form the concrete matrix, and 80 to 90% of the hydration is accomplished within the first seven days. I'm gonna add a, a sub note here. ACI, the American Concrete Institute says, if you don't have any freezing taking place, you must cure concrete for a minimum of three days. If you do have freezing, then you must cure it for seven days. And that's either leaving the formwork in place, applying a membrane forming curing compound or other methods. Water loss during hydration is increased by heat, sun, low humidity and wind. Those are all pretty intuitive. Lack of curing leads to greater permeability of the concrete, lower abrasion resistance, lower strength, loss of durability, dusting, drying shrinkage, cracking, and curling. Plastic shrinkage, by definition, is where the rate of evaporation exceeds the rate of bleed. So you'll see small cracks on the surface. It looks like a cake that's come out of the oven. 
And you can tell those are plastic shrinkage cracks as opposed to structural cracks, which appear more sharp and angular. Again, high rate of surface evaporation is caused by ambient temperature being very high, relative humidity being very low, high winds, and the temperature of the concrete. Some other defects associated with improper curing are crazing and map cracking and dusting. Slab curling. If you've ever been in a warehouse, you can see where the slab curls up on the joints and the forklifts are beginning to knock the edges down. You'll know that slab curling has occurred. Now, why is that? Simply because the notion of the top of the slab is, is drying first due to a lack of a curing compound or a sheet membrane which causes the slab to in fact curl as that concrete begins to shrink on the surface and the bottom stays moist. We can also see mortar flaking and scaling. Now, one of the ways to help mitigate that on the job site, of course, is that every good contractor during the summer has an available so-called monomolecular film. Our trade name is known as Aquafilm Concentrate J74 and J74 ready to use. These materials do not become part of the water cement rate matrix. They simply uh, reduce the amount of evaporation during finishing on the job site. All right, so what is ACI 308? ACI 308 actually addresses the finishing of concrete. It is not a specification in and of itself, although a lot of job documents will refer back to ACI 308. ACI specifically refers back to ASTM uh, C309 or 1315 when it comes to curing. However, they do discuss the methods or uh, acceptable methods for curing concrete, including timing of application, um, whether moist curing is acceptable, sheet membrane, wet burlap, or membrane forming curing compounds. These are all acceptable methods of curing concrete. Now, one of the main reasons, obviously, contractors opt for the membrane forming curing compound, it's the least time consuming and least messy. If you're out on a job site with a lot of burlap, they got to roll it up. If you're out on a water cured job site, like the slide in the upper right hand corner, you've got to pond the water and figure out a way of supplying water to the job site continuously while the concrete is curing. Keep in mind what I said earlier, three days when there's no freezing available, seven days when there's freezing uh, happening. Cures and cure and seals are easy ways to reduce evaporation. That's why they are preferred. And I would say 90% of the concrete in this country is cured with a membrane forming curing compound. Now, what's the difference between a cure and a cure and seal? Cures are, are forming a membrane. They hold the water in during that period of time as specified by AS, ACI. Um, they do eventually dry out, dissipate and blow away. Um, cures and seals, stay in place longer and they're meant to seal the concrete and protect it long term. Here's a picture of a, uh, of a large tining rig out on a job site uh, for paving. Uh, it, it's worth noting that pavement mixed designs are very low in the water cement ratio. They run about 0.38 to 0.39. So the available water available for hydration is lower to begin with versus a commercial mix, which should be going into a wall form. And that's so the concrete can hold its shape. The reason they're white pigmented is because it helps keep it cooler, keep the concrete cooler by reflecting sunlight. It in fact keeps the, cool, uh, the concrete um, at a, an acceptable temperature so that it does not lose as much water to the atmosphere as a non-pigmented material. All right, so at the top, you'll notice that ASTM C309 does reference AASHTO M148. You'll see a lot of old state specifications and county and city specifications referring to AASHTO. Uh, ASTM embraces the AASHTO spec, so as long as you're meeting the ASTM, you will meet the AASHTO M148. AASHTO stands for American Association of State and Highway Transportation Officials. These were the first set of specifications written in the United States to help um, standardize road construction going back to the 1930s. So the first point of ASTM C309 is that the curing compound must be film forming. That eliminates silicates and any other products that are out there. They must be film forming. Within ASTM C309 is the ASTM C156 spec, 
which limits the amount of water loss out of a given sample to 0.55 kilograms per meter squared in 72 hours when applied at 200 square feet per gallon. There's also a temperature consideration in there. These are tested at about 80 to 90 degrees in the lab in a, in a curing chamber. All right, the types of cure are divided by type and class. So a type one is clear, a type 1D is clear with fugitive dye, and a type two is white pigmented. A quick note on the, on the dye. In the early days, in the early days when these materials were all solvent-based, and frankly, they're all water-based now, the material would spray out somewhat clear, and they would put a fusion of red dye in there so they could tell where they were spraying it, and also to aid the inspector in seeing if the uh, curing had been applied to the, to the job. Now, with the water-based materials, they actually spray out a little bit whitish or milkyish, and so you can see where they're spraying, but some states still require the fusion of dye. Uh, class A are considered waxes, and Class Bs are considered resins. Now, these are the these are the materials that actually form the membrane within the cure. Um, class As do not meet Class B, but Class Bs meet all Class As. If that makes sense. All right. So, Class A wax-based curing compounds do not dissipate, but like I said earlier, they they essentially dry out over time and uh, it will go away. The resin materials will dissipate and break down in 30 to 60 days. And as you can see, they, they kind of spray out a little bit yellowish white. Um, they do require sunlight and abrasion or weathering in order to break down. If you put it down in a basement and then cover up the basement and keep that, te that temperature down that basement cool, it will be a long time before that uh, dissip so-called dissipating cure wears off. All right, curing membrane application. They should be applied immediately after the disappearance of the surface water sheen following final finishing. Today's mixed designs are substantially less bleeding than the mixed designs that we worked with in the 80s and the early 90s. Uh, due to the advent of water reducing admixtures, um, there's much less water coming to the surface. So it's more of a it's more of an intuitive thing for the contractor to get the curing on the surface once he's done with finishing. Um, nine times out of 10, they'll wait till the end of the day on a hot day and then tell the guy, you know, that drew the low, low straw, hey, get on that slab and cure it out. Well, you got 100,000 square feet, probably a good idea to begin curing uh, while they're finishing from one end to the other. So start that curing as soon as you can. Application methods typically involve sprayers and uh, large rigs like you see in the upper left hand a photo with a tote up on the rig and high pressure nozzles, spraying it down on the pavement. This guy's spraying it too, and we see some trowel marks, but that's not important because that's a hard trowel surface. All right, uh, there's one other specification within the curing world, just curing by itself, and that's the Corps of Engineers CRD C300. That is a special, very robust specification for water loss. And it does need to be uh, special ordered from us and from other manufacturers uh, because it does require higher solids to maintain uh, better water within the, um, within the mix. All right, the resin cures, again, uh, are water-based, are membrane, and uh, they do meet ASTM C309 type two classes A and B. Our clear resin cure J11W meets ASTM C309 type one class A and B again. It is available with a dye, but that is unique and that will be a special order. Um, it does meet the current lead uh, California Department of Public Health version 1.2. We're seeing that spec around quite a bit in the United States and it's a, uh, it's a testing chamber where the material is applied, the chamber is enclosed almost like a bioatmosphere. And then the air is checked for any kind of solvents or things that would be unhealthy. Our clear cure J7WB is unique relative to J11 or J10 because it does rapidly break down. And we have also tested it to NSF 61, which is the National Science Foundation for Water Quality Standard. 
standards. This is the only cure that can be used in conjunction with potable water transport and storage. It also meets the lead California Department of Public Health v. Uh, version 1.2 testing. Anticipation normally begins within seven to 10 days. All right, now we're gonna leave the cures and go on to curing and sealing. But what are the differences? All right, cures are meant to dissipate, dry out and go away. Cures and seals are meant to cure and provide lasting protection and beautification for the concrete. They are considered more what we would call long distance runners and that the UV doesn't break them down. Um, however, abrasion and you know, heavy, heavy use environment will break them down in time. Um, again, they follow ASTM and they also follow the ASTM C1315 spec, which was developed in the mid 90s in order to address yellowing of these products. In the early days, they yellowed substantially and they would wear off. And uh, so now ASTM developed a standard to address the types and classes of the clear acrylics. Uh, type one is clear, type two is white pigmented again. A is considered non-yellowing over time, exposure to UV. B may have moderate yellowing and C may severely darken and no yellowing requirement. I don't see many cure and seals out on the market, either Dayton Superior or other products that don't meet at least the A and the B. The C's go way back and we don't see many of those anymore in the marketplace. The major requirements are that they are film forming. They are 25% minimum solids. Again, they meet a more stringent water loss under ASTM C156 and they are UV tested to meet that A, B and C class. Other testing, they may have some al acid alkaline testing. There is an adhesion test within 1315, talking about um, adhesion to uh, surface goods, mastic tiles, wood flooring, et cetera. But um, you should always refer back to the manufacturer's requirements of those sheet goods for the relative slab humidity. That's a whole nother presentation that we won't even get into today. All right, cure and seal application. Spraying uh, is always a great idea. Uh, high volume, low pressure. Um, rolling, I prefer rolling when we're working with decorative concrete and things that have a lot of texture to it. And a combination can also be used spraying and back rolling. Another pretty picture of a cure and seal put down, high solids. Gives it a, the higher the solids, the better the sheen. And that's typical. All right, Dayton's products consist of the following. Um, our water-based products, the 1315 J22WB, and as the name implies, it meets the 1315 spec. It also meets the C309 spec, and it is non-yellowing. We also make a Cure and Seal 309J18 that does not meet the 1315. It's a little bit more um, economical, but it does the job as needed. Our water-based cure and seals continued. The cure and seal 309 EF, it meets all the national VOC laws, including California and Canada. It's water-based, non-yellowing. It meets the lead uh, California Department of Public Health version 1.2 and meets ASTM C309. The cure and seal 13 EF is water-based. It's high solids. It's a non-yellowing acrylic, so you get a little bit more shine out of it. It also meets the California Department of Public Health version 1.2 testing and is also low VOC. All right, we get into the solvent-based materials. <clears throat> the J20UV has been Dayton's leading cure and seal for years. It's a 25% solid material. It's non-yellowing. It meets both ASTM and C1315. And it has the, the added benefit of being able to be applied in, in cooler weather, cooler temperatures because the resin doesn't thicken up as much as other products may. Then we have the J22 UV, which is um, a little bit more cost competitive. Um, it competes very well with a lot of the other major brands on the marketplace. It also meets C309 and C1315. We have two low VOC uh, versions of, of these products. The J20 low VOC can be used in California and Colorado and other places where the VOC exemption is in place. 
And uh, we also have a high solids uh, cured seal, the J23 LVOC, which also could be used in Colorado and other locations. So um, we, have, we have it covered from water-based to low VOC solvents to regular solvents. All right, so talking to contractors, is it interior or exterior? If it's an interior, that's kind of a no-brainer. You might want to consider a water-based product and not deal with the smell of the solvents. Um, do the specs call out 1315 or C309, or do they specify another water loss? I've seen that more times than one over the years. Do the, do the specs refer to an ASTM standard or an ACI document? Is the contractor buying for price or performance? Hopefully they're buying for performance. Is the material being placed in an enclosed area or outside? That goes back to point number one. And what are the VOC restrictions in your region where you're using it or selling it? We have a host of resources available through our website. If you'll just go to www.datesuperior.com, you'll have links to the data sheets. You'll have links to BOT approvals for the curing compounds. You'll have uh, other supporting documents like product selection guides. And you'll also have some curing membrane product selection guides. All right, so in summarizing, curing is an action versus a process. Cement water reaction equals hydration. If you don't have the cement water reaction, you won't have hydration. Hydration is enhanced and preserved through the action of curing or the action of cure and seal. The consequences of not curing can lead to defects and structural defects in the concrete. Curing methods are called out by ACI 308, which will reference membrane forming curing compounds, which again refer back to ASTM C309, ASTM 1315. It also calls out wet curing or membrane or burlap. Uh, we saw the difference between cures and cure and seals. And then we just summarize it with the industry standards, C309 and 1315. And in parentheses, you can say the Corps of Engineers CRD C300. That's typically only curing. The Corps of Engineers is not interested in curing and sealing. And that summarizes our action today. If we have any questions. Great. Thanks, Todd. I told you guys he'd been around the block or two. Very informative, very informative. Um, so I'm looking at the chat. If you have any questions, please put them in there and I will discuss it to the team and we'll get an answer for you. Um, so while you think of those questions and input them for me, I just want to extend a great thank you for joining us today. Um, just as a reminder, we have our Training Tuesday webinars every Tuesday at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on various subject matters and with different product experts like Todd today. The recording for today's presentation will be available online around 3 p.m. or shortly after. Again, if you have any questions, go ahead and put those into the chat for me. So with that recording, I'm gonna send out an email a little bit later on letting you guys know um, how to access it. And don't forget to sign up for the next Training Tuesday that'll happen on the 31st. If you happen to miss this, um, you can re-listen to it or forward it. And there's additional trainings out there too, different modules as well as the Training Tuesday webinars um, on our YouTube channel. Feel free to take a look at those. And it looks like, Todd, we don't have any questions, so we'll just give it a second more and call it a, call it a day. Again, a plug for our Dayton superior.com. Like Todd mentioned, we've got all the data sheets out there, safety data sheets, as well as uh, the product pages to let you know about it with the product numbers, um, a contact page to let you know who your sales representative is. And I think that's it. So again, thank you for joining and we will see you next Tuesday. Thanks everyone. Thank you.